Great. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited uh, to have you here today. Today is a very special um, session of our case discussions um, that we usually have because we have a guest, Andre Mansour, who is um, Associate Professor for uh, Medicine from Portland, Oregon. And um, he's a big teacher also when it comes to uh, clinical diagnosis or clinical um, examination and diagnosis with the help of that. And some of you might also know him from the book Frameworks for Internal Medicine. Um, so we're really excited to just have Andre here today with us and learn from him uh, with his physical diagnosis Podbury. And just for everybody who might be new here, um, I'm Leia. I'm a medical student from Austria. And um, together with Sammy and Julie, we organize clinical case discussions weekly. We're really passionate uh, when it comes to internal medicine and clinical reasoning. And we also have Nicola here on the team today who established the contact with Andre. Um, so big thanks to you, Nicola, as well. And um, I will I want to give over the microphone for to Andre also to for you to just introduce yourself to the crowd and um, then share something um, about yourself and maybe also one thing you like to do outside of medicine. And uh, then we would kind of start the session. Wonderful. Thank you, Leah, for for uh, for giving the opportunity to introduce myself. So. I'm Andre Mansour. I'm one of the um, internal medicine hospitalists here in Portland, Oregon, at a teaching hospital. And um, as Leah mentioned, I'm pretty passionate about a couple of things in medicine. Um, one would be physical examination, which is what this talk is all about today, and also diagnostic reasoning, which also sort of ties into this talk. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. And uh, uh, Nicole and I have connected in the past uh, to give these talks and it al always works out. It's always a lot of fun for, uh, for me and hopefully for you all today as well. Um, outside of medicine, I like to play basketball. I play basketball a couple nights a week. I play soccer as well or football as it's probably known uh, in your parts of the world and, um, and, and everywhere else actually outside the US. But um, so that, you know, that's pretty much what I like to do. I like to spend time with my family as well. I've got um, a bunch of nieces and nephews and uh, there's anywhere from one year, one year old to, you know, 15. So it's a lot of fun with that group. Um, as uh, Leah had mentioned, um, this is a, this is an interactive talk. So feel free to sort of unmute yourselves, you know, if you want to speak up or if you want to use the chat box, I think. Lynn and Nicole are going to be sort of monitoring the chat box. I'll ask questions for the talk and, you know, hopefully, hopefully you guys feel comfortable enough to answer questions that I ask. And then, and likewise, you know, vice versa, you can ask me questions at any point. So this talk is uh, called Physical Diagnosis Potpourri. And um, you'll see that there's a detective on the title slide. And that's because I always make the analogy with medicine that, that internists especially are a lot like detectives who have to comb the scene of a crime to gather clues that they use to solve a case. And uh, this sort of ties in with how I define diagnostic reasoning. And I define it as the skillful acquisition and use of clues from a patient's history, physical exam, and other data to make a diagnosis. And there's a strong emphasis on acquisition. It's not just the use of clues, but the acquisition and use of clues to solve a case. Uh, you know, much like the detective, we have to be at the scene of the crime, the patient's bedside, and we have to acquire the clues that, that, that are there. You know, you can imagine a crime scene that's identical. Ten different detectives will, can evaluate that crime scene, and some of them are going to glean important clues and pieces of information that others, you know, miss. And... Um, you know the same is true in medicine so we have to be we have to be there to gather those clues the clinician who gathers more clues is much more likely to solve the case and the physical exam is a rich source of clues i cannot overemphasize that that you know over the years we've seen so many cases where the diagnosis would have been made much sooner uh if if someone had observed the the finding that was there waiting to be observed um and uh was ignored or missed um so uh, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about 15 cases where physical exam made a you know difference in diagnosis, or would have. As I just mentioned, there's you know patients will some, sometimes suffer for 
you know, weeks, months, even longer in some cases without a diagnosis. Again, all the while a, a physical finding was there waiting to be discovered and really would have made quick work of the diagnosis, you know, and would have allowed for the commencement of treatment and, uh, and you know, things like prognosis and other things. I always say diagnosis is critical in medicine. It's the it's the fundament, it's it's fundamental to medicine. We have to know the diagnosis before we can move forward in any way. So um, we're going to get uh, through to these cases, and these cases are uh, media heavy. There are images, audio files, there's videos. So hopefully you're on a device that can handle that type of media, and um, you know use headphones if you if you need to. Um, uh, but uh, we'll get through these cases, and like I said, feel free to speak up at any point. So we're going to move into case number one, and before we do, I just want to make sure that. Everyone is aware that all the patients used in this presentation have been consented. Really want to thank the patients who allowed for their images to be taken. Um, we obviously could not have a presentation like this without them. So really a big thank you to all the patients who are featured in this presentation. So uh, patient number one, we're going to be very light on history. This is a talk mostly about physical diagnosis. Um, and in truth, and we use the history and the physical exam together and laboratory testing and imaging and things, but uh, this talk is focused on physical diagnosis. So very light on history, middle-aged woman here with fatigue, and now it's your turn. Uh, what do you notice in these images? What physical findings are observable in the image of the patient of the, of the woman's face, her head and neck area, and her, the palm, and her hands here? What do you notice? Yeah. And as previous groups, uh, you all are spot on and answering questions right away, which I love. There is absolutely jaundice, uh, which is a yellowing a tint of the skin and sclera. You can see it in her sclera very well. Um, there are three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. And patients can sort of trend toward one of those colors. And that gives us very important information about the patient. If they trend toward blue, you know, they're cyanotic. That tells us about the presence of a right to left shunt. In this case, in this case, the, the patient is trending toward yellow, which tells us that perhaps uh, her, her liver might be involved here and might be diseased. You also picked up on the spider angiomas, which are, you know, on her chest here. These are a special form of telangiectasia. Notice spider angiomas. We're going to get a close up of those in one minute. Before I do, uh, let's talk about the other finding that you all observed, which is palmar erythema, a bit of a misnomer in that the palm is actually spared, but the erythema or redness really involves the thenar, hypothenar, the pads of the, of the hands, the pads of the fingers. So it's really around the palm, but absolutely great uh, observation there. And here's the close-up of the spider angioma. So the center, uh, central arterial here, um, and then the legs of the spider, that this is the body of the spider, and then the little capillaries that radiate out resemble the legs of a spider. And when you compress this lesion, it does something unique. It fills from the inside out. You see how it does that? That is specific to spider angiomas. And here it is in slow motion, dramatic effect. Um, so let's go to the next finding of the same patient who um, also you notice has a protuberant abdomen. And anytime you see abdominal distension, uh, the first thing I ask myself is, is it symmetrically distended or asymmetrically distended? If it's uh, asymmetrically distended, then I'm wondering, is it, you know, a is it an organ like a liver or a spleen? Is it a tumor? something of that nature is it, if it's symmetrically distended that does suggest potentially uh the presence of ascites or acidic fluid within the abdominal cavity and there's a test that you can do once you've reached that point to decide because not all symmetric distension is fluid it could be constipation it could be you know gas so uh what we can do then is something called shifting dullness which i'm demonstrating in this video where we're going to percuss the top of the abdomen. We're going to find that tympanitic note. And then we're going to start to percuss laterally. And we're going to find an area where it changes from tympanitic note to dull, a dullness. And again, not all dullness is fluid, 
But if we have the patient then shift position, because the fluid is going to stay in the dependent area of the cavity. So if you have if you have it here and the patient shifts, all of a sudden what was just dull now becomes tympanitic again because now it's up here above the level of the fluid. If that makes sense, let's play the video. way to panic again so that's shifting dull. oh hopefully that was projecting well but it went from dull to tympanitic suggesting the presence of ascites so now we have a, a, a woman presenting with jaundice spider angiomas palmar erythema and ascites and what is the underlying diagnosis here and i'm not trying to fool you in any of these cases so if it seems obvious it likely is that this is cirrhosis absolutely and I choose this as the first case because not only is it exceedingly common, um, and you'll see it a lot, but um, not necessarily because, you know, um, this diagnosis is difficult to make, um, but the absence of these findings should make you question whether the patient truly has cirrhosis or not. Over the years, we've seen a handful of cases where a patient comes to us with a diagnosis of cirrhosis. They don't have these findings. It turns out that they have a mimicker of cirrhosis, like constrictive pericarditis, for example. So, um, you know, be uh, skeptical if you see a patient with a diagnosis of cirrhosis who does not have these findings. Let's move into patient number two is a young man presenting with fever and chills. Again, very light on the history. And here's an image of his palm. And what do you notice? Yeah, there are some nodules there and they're tender. They are tender and um, uh, they are uh, also sort of distributed in a similar distribution as palmar erythema around the thenar, hypothenar pads of the fingers. Um, and you all are already honing in on what the underlying diagnosis might be. And here's an image of his feet. And these are non-tender macular lesions echomotic type lesions here. Um, and these are, uh, yes, these are exactly, these are the Janeway lesions. The other are, is the Osler nodes are tender and they're nodular and you can, palp you can palpate them. The Janeway lesions are not. And I like this image because it highlights the fact that some patients don't have any findings on their hands. And when you, so you shouldn't stop there. You should go and look at their feet because sometimes they have the findings you're looking for only on their feet. In this case, we have them in both the feet and the hands. That's right. That's a good mnemonic, Nicola. I like that. And so um, we should formulate a hypothesis, which you already have. Uh, some of you have already mentioned infective endocarditis. And, you know, such a big part of medicine is anticipation. It's the key. It's key to medicine. The eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know, or in this case, the ears can't hear what the mind doesn't know. So when you think, when you see these findings and you reach a hypothesis like infective endocarditis, you should then anticipate what you might see next, because otherwise you're liable to miss it. And in this case, we're moving into to cardiac auscultation. So when we listen to the heart, we should anticipate, well, in a patient with infective endocarditis, what types of, of valve lesions do these patients uh, suffer from? What type of valve lesion develop in patients with infective endocarditis? The two main valve lesions are going to be stenosis and regurgitation. So endocarditis is associated with which type of lesion? Exactly, insufficiency or regurgitation. So we should listen for that. We should listen for that type of murmur. Before we do, here's a control of normal S1, S2. But that is not what we hear in our patient. We hear this in our patient. And here it is annotated. So this is S1, this is S2. Now, admittedly, I don't hear S1 or S2 really in the recording. All I hear is this murmur. Okay, um, the murmur is so dominant that it kind of drowns out S1 and S2. So I just hear. Whoosh. 
And as you can see from the video, uh, we're listening over the apex with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And Paul is absolutely correct. This is um, all of the characteristics of mitral regurgitation. It's in the right area. Um, it's a holosystolic or plateau-shaped murmur that starts right with S1 and goes all the way to S2. And so the diagnosis here is endocarditis involving the mitral valve. But this case didn't end here. A few days, so the patient gets diagnosed with mitral valve endocarditis, and a few days into his hospitalization, his heart sounds change. And they went from what we just heard earlier to now this. Does anybody know what we're listening to here? What is this? Yes, exactly. This is a pericardial friction rub. You all are amazing. This is a difficult one for people, but it's a very unique sound. And some people liken it to walking on fresh snow. Some people uh, liken it to the creaking of old leather. Or, you know, if you imagine like a balloon and you take a balloon and you put water on it, you wet the balloon and you rub your hand over the wet balloon. It kind of makes that funny sound. Very unique to, to friction rubs. They also sound like they're pretty close to the chest wall, almost like they're just underneath the surface. And they're going to either have one, two, or three components. In this case, we have all three components. It's a... So now, now we know that this patient's endocarditis has evolved to involve the pericardium, the sac around the heart. And that's really important information. Because a few days after that, the patient becomes hypotensive. He feels like he's going to pass out. Now, when you listen to the heart, the rub is gone. In fact, his heart sounds are a little bit more distant. And this is what his neck look like. He's in the upright position. We can see the external. He's got what looks like two external jugular veins for whatever reason, um, and an anatomical variant. And they're both engorged. And you can see the skin moving up here. Absolutely. Sarah has clued in to what is going on with this patient. Why is he presyncopal? Why is he hypotensive? Well, we can make the diagnosis of uh, cardiac tamponade, as Sarah is alluding to, he's got the, he's got Beck's triad, have hypotension, distant heart sounds, elevated JVP, and um, the astute clinician is able to arrive at this life-threatening diagnosis quickly because we heard that pericardial friction rub. We knew that the pericardium was, in, was involved, and as soon as it, you know, what happens is you, you, there's inflammation of the, of the visceral and parietal pericardium, so it makes this noise with different components of the cardiac cycle. There's two in diastole and one in systole. And when fluid fills that space, or in this case, it was pus, it separates those layers. And so you no longer hear that friction rub. And because of that fluid or material, you the, the heart sounds become distant and tamponade ensues. And this is a good reminder of why we examine patients every day. We do, we do serial physical exams for this very reason, because patient exams can evolve and you, you want to be the clinician who's not caught off guard. Oh, I haven't listened to the patient since day one. You've been listening the whole time. So you were able to track this story and you were able to make the diagnosis quickly. This is a young woman who came in with uh, joint pain. So she actually presented initially to her primary care doctor with, uh, with foot pain. She was getting redness and swelling and pain over the dorsum of her foot. And the uh, primary care doctor said, this is probably an overuse injury. Here's some NSAID medications. Here's some, uh, you know, I sit, elevate it, stay off of it. And sure enough, it got better, but then it started to involve her other foot. And then it started to involve her knee and her, she was having knee pain and redness and swelling. So she comes in to the um, emergency room this time 
and um, they sample the fluid. They, they do a, uh, a uh, joint aspiration, an arthrocentesis, and uh, there's something like 15,000 white cells in her fluid. No organisms are seen. She's presumed to have uh, septic arthritis, and she goes in for a washout procedure. Does not get better. They take her for a second washout procedure. Still does not get better, and so then comes to our hospital, and I'm meeting her here on that day that she transferred. And I am, you know, have a hypothesis. So I look at her fingernails. Because of a hypothesis, she's got this migratory inflammatory arthritis. She's a young woman. And I don't see what I expected to see, but I see this, and I had no idea what this was when I looked at it. Does anybody know what this finding here is called? I had no clue, but then I looked it up, and I realized that absolutely this is the oil drop sign. You guys are smarter than I am because I did not know what this was, but I looked it up, and I realized that you know what I, what I was looking for was pitting of the nail bed you know, uh, onycholysis type type of, uh, of thing. And I saw this and when I looked it up, I realized that this can present, this can be a sign of the same condition. And so, you know, knowing that, then I look elsewhere on her body and hiding behind her hairline, you had to lift her hair up, was this lesion. And hiding behind her right ear was this lesion. There was nowhere else on her body that was affected. Anybody know what that is? Dietmar is already answering the question two steps ahead. This is, these are psoriatic plaques and this patient has psoriatic arthritis. And, um, you know, this is a great case. It demonstrates, again, the cost to not only patients, but the healthcare system. She underwent two completely unnecessary surgical procedures when these physical findings were there and waiting to be discovered and were not discovered. And so she, again, underwent two unnecessary surgical procedures, which are not without risk um, when, when the diagnosis could have been made based on the history and the exam alone. So nice job on that case. The next case involves another young woman coming in with lightheadedness and here's her hand and there's my hand in the corner. Anytime you see me anywhere in these photographs, I'm automatically the normal control because there's, I'm completely normal. Everything about me is normal. And so my hands here are uh, the normal control. So what do you notice about her hands here? Maybe with regard to her color, yes, exactly. And you would know, is her, are her knuckles hyperpigmented or is it the rest of her hand that's more pale? In this case, you ask her and know this is her normal skin tone. So her knuckles are pigmented, just hyperpigmented, just as you all pointed out. And there is another patient here. This condition typically starts off in the areas under high pressure, like the knuckles, the elbows, the buccal mucosa. Here's, and then it generalizes. And here's a patient with her same, the same condition uh, that had been, it, this had been going on for eight years. And he'd seen multiple doctors and uh, including a dermatologist and the diagnosis was never made. And here he is coming in uh, to the hospital now with, uh, with it. he's very, very sick. He had um, infective colitis and was very, very sick uh, because of his underlying condition. And uh, here he has generalized hyperpigmentation. So um, anybody know the diagnosis here? So hyperpigmentation, a patient who's lightheaded, this is Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency. And you know it's primary adrenal insufficiency. So when I think about adrenal insufficiency, I sort of break it down into ACTH dependent adrenal insufficiency and ACTH independent adrenal insufficiency. And if it's ACTH dependent, that means that the ACTH levels are low. The adrenal gland is working properly, but the, AC, the stimulus for the adrenal glands isn't around, it's a central process. If it's ACTH independent adrenal insufficiency, it means the ACTH is around. It's just that the glands aren't responding to that ACTH. So that's primary adrenal insufficiency. And why does why do you get hyperpigmentation with primary adrenal insufficiency? Is because ACTH mimics 
you know, it, it's similar to the molecule that stimulates the melanocortin one receptor in the skin. And it does stimulate that, that receptor and it causes hyperpigmentation as a result. And so the diagnosis here is, is adrenal insufficiency and Addison's disease in particular. And the, by the way, the astute clinician can tell when this patient became sick. And by the way, the other guy, he was very sick with his infective endocarditis because he had what's called adrenal crisis. So he was doing okay. Well, he was doing somewhat okay for a long time. And then when he gets sick, he really gets sick because he didn't have that cortisol around when he needed it. And the same thing happened to this woman. And you can tell when she got sick. Um, and you can tell based on her fingernails. So you'll you might notice that her fingernails have grown out. She last polished her nails, you know, a while ago. And it turns out that fingernails grow at about a millimeter per week. And there's about two to three millimeters of growth here. So she stopped, you know, painting her nails and sort of taking care of herself about two weeks ago uh, because she got sick. And when you ask her, that's exactly when she uh, first fell ill enough to stop painting her nails and things. Let's move into case number five. This is a very recent case, uh, just from a few months ago. It's a guy coming in with confusion and um, you ask him to follow your finger with his eyes. What do you notice there when he does that? What's that movement of his eye there? Nystagmus, absolutely. Absolutely, that is nystagmus. And um, by the way, this patient um, is a big drinker. He's drinking quite a bit of alcohol um, every day, um, which is why you, you tested this and you discover his nystagmus. So then uh, what you do is you, is you pull out a string from your pocket and you show it to the patient. And let's watch this video. If you're wondering, if you're squinting your eyes saying, where is that string? They're, they're, you're not crazy. There is no string. There is no string, but the patient is playing along with it. He's, he's acting as if there is a string and he's even reaching out and taking it from me. And before we pulled out the video camera, he was describing it as purple in color and he was describing the texture of it and we were passing it back and forth to each other. What's this called? Anybody know when the patient is highly suggestible? It is confabulation, exactly. And uh, Sarah has clued in on the diagnosis here. So you've got a guy coming in with confusion who's a drinker, has nystagmus and confabulation. And the diagnosis here is Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is thiamine deficiency. Exactly. You all nailed it. Um, that string sign, by the way, it's a, it's a fun one, but it's a high risk, high reward sort of a test because when it works, you know, it's amazing for the med students to see this person taking string that doesn't exist, play around with it, pass it back and forth. When it doesn't, when it's a negative test, you look a bit crazy to the patient because they're like, there is no string there. What are you talking about? So it's a high risk, high reward test. But uh, it, it, when it's positive, it can be it can be pretty amazing for the medical students and others around. So and by the way, I should note that the patient's not purposefully lying. They are just very suggestible because of their condition and they're not purposely trying to deceive in any way they're just going along with the story that's being presented to them that there's a string there or you can tell them things like i saw you on the news this morning tell me about that and they'll say yeah i was interviewed by the news because of x y and z and they'll just run with it and they'll take tell you a story sort of about whatever you know premise you give them so here's the next case. Um, and again, there are 15 cases, so we're uh, nearly halfway through here. Um, here's a gentleman coming in with blurry vision, and these are his hands. And what do you notice about these hands? It's 
probably easier to tell if my hand's in the picture. My, I'm the gloved hand and I can palm a basketball for a frame of reference. Yes, he's got these long spindly like fingers, thin, and this is known as arachnodactyly or spider like fingers. And um, iPhone Von Simone is already cluing in on the underlying, on the possible diagnosis here. What do you notice about his palate, about his mouth here? Taking this hypothesis, that uh, that we have about potentially Marfan syndrome, you look in the mouth. I don't look at every patient's mouth that I, that I examine, but if I have a hypothesis of Marfan syndrome, this is a hypothesis-driven exam. This is the idea about anticipation. So we anticipate to see it, now we see it. This is we're gonna go missed 90% of the time, you know, unless you think about it and you look. And he has a high arch palate, otherwise known as an ogival arch. What is an OG? An OG describes an arch that has a point at the top. It comes, unlike the normal, when we think of an arch, we think of a smooth ceiling. An ogival arch, which is popular in Gothic era architecture, comes up to a point. Okay, that's an ogival arch. And here's an example of an ogival arch. I was looking around on Google Images for examples, and I thought, you know what, maybe I have an example of my own. I always like to use my, my own images when I can. And uh, so I was looking through images from Syria when I was there in 2010. It turns out there are a lot of arches inside Syria. And this comes from a famous castle in Syria known as uh, Al Hussein or Crack de Chevalet in French. Uh, it was a, a, a castle constructed in the Middle Ages and where, where you know this style of arch was popular. So here it comes up and then it comes up to a point. And this is an archer slit in that castle. So this is where the archers would hang out and wait for any encroaching enemies and they would fire their arrows at them. And this is a look of the outside of that castle, again, known as Al Hussein in Arabic or Crack de Chevalet in French. Very beautiful, uh, well-preserved castle. This is another arch from a, a church inside uh, a very famous village in Syria. Um, and you can see the, the typical sort of, you know, arch, that's not what we're seeing in our patient. Oh, here's some Roman, ruins inside uh, Damascus, a very modern city. You're walking around, you see everything is modern, and then you turn and you see these 2,000-year-old structures. You know, it's pretty, the juxtaposition is pretty amazing when you're, when you're there. But that's not the arch our patient has. He has an ogival arch. And the diagnosis here is, as you all already got, it's Marfan syndrome. And the blurry vision is because of lens dislocation, as uh, uh, Von Simon had already mentioned earlier in the chat. And I am probably totally mispronouncing your names in my ridiculous American accent. So I, I apologize for that. It's funny because when Leah was saying my name, she made Andre sound much better to me, but I'm probably ruining your names. So my, my apologies. So case number seven is a 65 year old man with dyspnea. Okay. And that we're taking a video of the patient's neck veins here. And the video is annotated, so pay attention to the annotations here. This movement, that inward movement that we're seeing is the jugular venous pulse. And what happens when the patient is breathing in? So there it is. The patient's breathing in. What happens to that movement? Is it going up the neck, down the neck? Yes, it rises. So here it is in the middle of the neck. He's about to take a breath in and look at it climb. Now it's going all the way up here. Now we can see that movement at the angle of the jaw. This is known as Kussmaul sign, as Paul uh, has mentioned in the chat box. And now we know something. Normally, when we take a breath in, we, we decrease our intrathoracic pressure, and that pulls the column of blood down toward the heart. So normally, the JVP goes down with inspiration. This paradoxical rise in JVP with inspiration is not normal. And it tells us something is not allowing the right ventricle to fill with blood. Because remember, when we breathe in, we're mobilizing blood from the legs and elsewhere back to the heart. And normally the RV can accept that and that JVP goes down. When the art, when there's a compliance issue with the RV for any reason, that blood that's coming back from the legs and the abdomen has nowhere else to go but up. 
And so uh, that tells us that there's some compliance issue or some issue with the R with RV filling in this patient. And um, Sammy has asked, yeah, a little bit about a distinguishing arterial and venous pulses. Yes, there are quite a few strategies for that. First of all, when you're evaluating the neck, you want to get the patient's neck and the torso roughly in the same plane like this. You want the neck to be nice and flat. You don't want the sternocleidomastoid muscles to be flexed and in your way. Those patients' neck is nice and flat. Now, you want to observe the neck for movement between the clavicle and the angle of the jaw. And you want to look from a tangential vantage point. Most people assume that they come and they look at the neck from a perpendicular perspective. And you will miss movement when you look at, at the neck from a perpendicular that movement becomes much easier to appreciate when you're looking at it from an oblique angle or a tangential angle, much like we are here from this vantage point. See how we're looking across? That allows us to see the movement. Now, as Sammy has alluded to, not all movement in the neck is the jugular venous pulse. Sometimes it's the arterial pulse or the carotid pulse. Now, there are a few strategies for distinguishing them. Just by looking at it, an arterial pulse has a single uh, pulse, a single outward movement that's quick and sharp. And obviously what goes out must come back in, but it does so very gradually and subtly. So really what you mostly see is an outward movement. That is classic arterial. The venous pulse, on the other hand, most of what you see, what will catch your eye is an inward movement. See how the, 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 the skin is collapsing in? That's the active part of the pulse. See how it's moving in towards the patient. That's active here and that's classic for venous. Also, look how diffuse it is. We can see the movement in a large area of the neck, whereas an arterial pulse tends to be pinpoint and takes up a small area of the neck. So those are a couple of the, the ways that you can distinguish them. And also, if it's dynamic, if it's moving with inspiration, that's more suggestive of a venous pulse in either direction. An arterial pulse, the reason you see it where you do or the reason you can feel it in the wrist where you, you can is it's all anatomical. That's where the artery courses closest to the surface of the skin. That is independent of breathing or movement or position or anything like that. So those are the ways that you can distinguish. And we're going to see some examples of an arterial pulse later in the talk. So hopefully that what I just talked about will make more sense. But this is definitely a venous pulse and it's moving up with inspiration. It tells us something about this patient's heart. And what else do you notice about the patient? There's a skin finding here that you probably wouldn't have picked up on because it's a you know very it's kind of blurry and it's in the corner of our video but i'm going to point it out here there's a little blue circle right underneath the a wave in our logo and he had several of them on his chest does anybody know what those marks are those are radiation tattoo markers absolutely so now we have two findings here the q small sign and radiation we know that he has radiation to the chest and we can put those two findings or, or, or the two pieces of information together to come up with a diagnosis here. So why is he short of breath? Why is he short of breath? And something's going on with my chat box here where it's here it's forcing me to reply so i'm just going to type something in up oh, to new map. okay there we go oh, now it's back yes you guys are absolutely right this is um uh this it, it happens to be constricted pericarditis from radiation absolutely you can also exactly uh sarah's right you can think radiation induced lung injury with interstitial lung disease leading to pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale with kusmal sign you can also get valvular disease from radiation, and that can lead to right heart failure. So the case, the diagnosis here ended up being radiation. And here's an up-close look at that radiation tattoo marker. You should look for these. Sometimes patients will um, not remember that they had radiation because they were, you know, in fact, this guy, he was in his 60s, and he didn't think that the radiation he had, you know, when he was, you know, a teenager for Hodgkin's lymphoma had any bearing on his health. Today, but that's in fact exactly when radiation, the sequela of radiation take hold is it's, it's decades later. And uh, so oh, somebody's asking, Leah's asking, okay, what is a tattoo? Yeah, this is you know, this is where the, the, the radiation oncologists mark the areas on the skin. They mark the radiation field. 
You know, they want to be very specific about where that radiation is going. They don't want to hit structures that, that, that they don't need to hit uh, and damage them. So they mark the radiation field with these tattoos on the patient's skin to, to, to hone in on where their, their beam of radiation is going. So these are iatrogenic tattoos. Yeah, and patients may not be forthcoming with this information. So I promise you, when you see these, uh, you'll be able to, um, you know, understand something about them that they might have forgotten or didn't didn't tell you about earlier on. Um, and by the way, this is this is what you hear when you listen to his heart. These two sounds are him breathing in, so ignore those. But uh, here's the annotated version. You're going to hear S1, you hear S2, and then this extra sound after S2 is known as a pericardial knock, and it goes right along with constrictive pericarditis. Case number eight, it's a young man coming in with rapid weight gain. This is what he looked like about a year ago. You can see a square jaw, uh, and this is what he looks like now. And he went in to see his doctors, and they told him, you know, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. That's all that, you know, and for months he thought that he was just, you know, eating too much or not exercising enough. And meanwhile, he's gaining more and more weight and um, it was not diet and exercise. So what do you notice here about this patient? Yeah. So you guys are honing in on the diagnosis, but before we do, let's talk about the findings. As Sarah mentioned, this is known as moon facies. Uh, there's adipose deposition in such a way that look his ear you can't see his ears anymore in the driver's license photo that his ears are clearly visible in that head-on view and um yes he also has acne he also has acne on his forehead that's a very important finding and uh, he also when you look at his abdomen again we're now we're on a hypothesis driven mission we have a hypothesis of cushing so now we're looking for things. Remember, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. And we're able to identify the striae. We're able to identify that buffalo hump. Okay, back there. And then you look at his skin. This is an important finding. This is his hand down here. This is a normal control. Notice the skin fold of his of his knuckle is uh, the normal is, is pretty thick. And you can look at yourself and you can just twist, twist the skin of your knuckle to create that fold. And you're you're gonna have nice thick skin cortisol thins the skin and look how paper cigarette paper thin his skin fold is and you all are absolutely correct this is cushing syndrome again gentleman was told struggled with his weight for months and was told you know you're just just not exercising enough or not not you know you're eating unhealthy or or what have you you're eating too much that's not the case he had a very uh, you know, severe case of Cushing syndrome. He had a disease driving this and multiple doctors failed him because they failed to find the findings. And thank you, Nicola, for uh, linking to Lynn Lorio's paper. Lynn Lorio is a, a mentor of mine. He was at OHSU for a long time and he wrote a, a really incredible review article on Cushing syndrome. Highly encourage you to check out that article. This is a cousin of mine who came in who is complaining of knee pain. And um, you know you can see that his, his left knee is quite swollen here. And in fact, he had shoulder pain and swelling. He had, his other knee was involved at times. He underwent multiple MRI procedures, all of which of course were normal negative. And here's an image of his mouth. And you can see this ulcer here on his lip and he had other ulcers in his mouth. And he had this migratory arthritis similar to that patient with psoriatic arthritis and uh, what if I told you that he had a diarrheal illness you know uh, about a month or two before his symptoms began what condition would you think about so a migratory inflammatory arthritis absolutely Sarah this is a case of reactive arthritis you could also think of inflammatory bowel disease because it has extra uh intestinal manifestations like arthritis. In this case, it was reactive arthritis. And most cases of reactive arthritis improve within or go away really within six months. Some percentage of them will persist beyond that. They're known as chronic. And unfortunately, that's what he developed. 
And uh, so here we are heading into a long weekend and his knee was swollen. You can see it's his other knee this time. It was his left knee in the image. Now it's his right knee. And uh, he wanted me to come over and drain that procedure. So here I am in his living room, uh, you know, performing a medical procedure. By the way, his, he's a lawyer. And so performing a medical procedure in a lawyer's living room while his wife takes pictures of you doing it, I do not recommend. But here in this case, it worked out. I got the fluid. He's smiling. I made sure to document that his he, that he was happy with the image or with the procedure. And uh, so there you go. You should also absolutely think about uh, Bichette syndrome, as somebody mentioned. And, um, you know, Sarah, so really uh, with Bichette's, you're going to get the, the, you know, you will get the oral ulcers, you will get the arthritis. You will also additionally get some other things like like ge uh, genital ulcers, which is highly specific for uh, Bichette's. Um, you will also, you know, have things like erythema nodosum in the legs, and you can ultimately biopsy it because uh, Bichette's is a, uh, is a is a form of vasculitis. So you should absolutely think about Bichette's though, because it's otherwise known as the Silk Road disease. And if you were paying attention to my talk, you would think maybe maybe uh, maybe Andre is Syrian because he went to Syria and he has all these pictures from Syria. And I mentioned this is my cousin, so you know. Uh, you might think this, it's a Silk Road disease from China all the way to the Levantine area, the um, you know Palestine, Iraq, Syria, uh, Lebanon, and uh, so on and so forth. So there is a higher percentage of individuals from Syria with Bichette. So you should absolutely have been thinking about uh, Bichette's. And then also um, familial Mediterranean fever can sometimes present in this way as well. So good pickup there. Okay, so we're rounding uh, out the last couple of cases. And this uh, is one of my favorite cases is a 62 year old guy coming in with um, the clinical syndrome of heart failure. So he had orthopnea, PND, weight gain, and uh, elevated J JVP. And here are his vital signs. And what do you notice about his vital signs? Yes, he has a wide pulse pressure. Look at the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic pressure. It's quite wide, over 100. And when I saw this, even before I entered the room, the hypotheses are starting to form in my head. I have a knee-jerk reaction when I see a wide pulse pressure, and I think, ah, I bet he has this lesion. What lesion am I, am I thinking about? What valve condition can often lead to a wide pulse pressure? Aortic insufficiency, that's what I usually think about. And so before I even walked into the room, I said, oh, it must be aortic insufficiency. So I look at his, ha his, his hands. The hands are a rich source of clues. And here are his fingernails. And what do you notice? This is a video, by the way. So what, pay attention to his fingernail beds and tell me what you see. This is one of those things where when you see it, you see it. But it's a little bit hard to appreciate it first. Um, Sammy, there's really no hard and fast rule or, or no specific number. Um, I mean, 120 over 80 is your classic blood pressure. So, you know, if I start to see, I don't know, maybe like above 50 or something like that for a, a wide, and they're not older because sometimes stiff pipes, stiff blood vessels can give you a wide pulse pressure. So older patients can get a wide pulse pressure because their their arteries are stiff. So they're, they're each heartbeat really uh, shoots the pressure up very high. And this is nail bed pulsation, as you all are uh, observing here, they're known as Quinky's pulse. So I'm thinking, oh, he definitely has uh, aortic insufficiency. And if, if you're thinking about aortic, aortic insufficiency, you'll go to the neck and you'll look in the neck for a specific finding. What does aortic insufficiency do to the peripheral pulses? It makes them vigorous. And here is a very vigorous arterial pulse. And, and this is what I was talking about earlier. See, it's a single outward pulsation and it's a relatively takes up a small area of the neck. Here's two different pulses. And this is uh, known as Corrigan's pulse. So I'm thinking, ah, he definitely has aortic insufficiency. But what if I told you, what if I told you that he did not have a diastolic murmur when I listened to his heart? And what if I told you that uh, the echocardiogram was totally normal? normal systolic function, uh, the aortic valve they describe as pristine. They use that word pristine, probably just to make me feel worse about getting the diagnosis wrong. Because I said, oh, this is going to be aortic insufficiency. 
pristine aortic valve. So it turns out that these that these physical findings are they're absolutely not specific for aortic regurgitation. They are just indicative of a hyperkinetic state, okay, a high output state. And Sammy just gave the diagnosis here, high output heart failure. This is a subtype of heart failure where these patients, normally we think of heart failure, it's a low cardiac output state. A small subset of them will develop a high hyperkinetic high output state because of peripheral vasodilation. And uh, they develop things like Quinky's pulse and Corrigan's pulse and a wide pulse pressure. And what are the causes of high output heart failure? Well, one of them is wet beriberi, as uh, Von Simone is mentioning in the, in the chat. And uh, that comes from thiamine deficiency, which is, this is the wet form of beriberi. The other form we saw earlier with a confabulating patient is dry beriberi. Hyperthyroidism can also do it, absolutely. Liver disease, severe anemia, AVMs, those are all the causes of high output heart failure. And if we're thinking about thiamine deficiency, what, what's the biggest risk factor, at least in, in our parts of the world? Who develops thiamine deficiency like the other patient? What, what condition did he, did he have or what was he doing that, that drove his thiamine deficiency? Alcoholism. So you ask this patient and it turns out he is you know, drinking you know, multiple glasses of wine a day, setting him up for wet berry berry, and you measure the level and it's undetectable, making the diagnosis of thiamine deficiency. And why do I like this case so much? Well, it's totally curable, this form of heart failure, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, I would say in most cases, this patient would have been given the diagnosis of heart failure. And when the echo is normal, we put so much stock in the echo. The echo is, is the Bible for, for so many people. And, oh, it was normal. So what do we call that? Somebody with heart failure with a normal echocardiogram. It's, we call that heart failure with preserved systolic function. Very common diagnosis. We probably, he probably would have been given that diagnosis, would have been given diuretics. We don't, we're not sure why you have this. It's very common, but, you know, uh, here, take these diuretics, you'll feel better. Well, no, because the physical findings, the wide pulse pressure, the Quinky's pulse, the Corrigan's pulse led to uh, the specific diagnosis of high output heart failure and wet beriberi, which is totally treatable. Look at with alcohol cessation and thiamine replacement, look at his blood pressure over time. Blue is systolic, orange diastolic, green is the pulse pressure between them. And look how it falls from, it starts at off at over 100 and it falls with treatment. And he was cured, no longer needed diuretics and no longer had heart failure. This is known as an Augenblick diagnosis for the, uh, for the Austrians. So a diagnosis, and I'm totally mispronouncing that, I'm positive I am. Uh, uh, Augenblick, so blink of an eye, you can make this diagnosis just like that. And here is the video associated with this diagnosis. This is the jugular venous pulse. And it. most people thought this was arterial, but no, this is not arterial. Arterial is a pinpoint area. Look how diffuse this is. And look at that collapse. That collapse is almost as impressive as the wave. Anybody know what valve condition leads to this sign? It's otherwise known as a CV fusion wave or Lanchese sign in the neck. This is tricuspid insufficiency. Thomas Lobb, absolutely correct on that one. That is an Augenblick diagnosis. And patients can also develop, um, like this patient, she has the same lesion. What do you notice about her head? You can see some action in her neck here too. So she has the same tricuspid region. Yeah, it's bobbing and it's, side to, it's bobbing side to side because as that uh, bolus of blood is shooting up the neck. It's causing the head to, to move side to side. Absolutely. Okay, a couple more cases. This, and I know we, we only have about five or six more minutes. So if you want to stop now and we can do questions or we can go forward with the other couple of cases, it's, it's up to you. You want to keep going? Okay. Okay, great. So this guy, um, we were, I was actually doing procedures. I was, we have a service in the hospital where we just go around and do paracentesis, thoracentesis, lumbar puncture. And our team was asked to do a paracentesis on this patient who's on the oncology service. And, um, oh, that's it. That's an interesting, interesting guess. Yeah, you would think that these um, vessels are inflamed potentially, but 
um, we were called to do this paracentesis on this oncology patient, and we noticed these these vessels are engorged, maybe inflamed. We don't know. We we have the patient turn his head, and it's all over his his head, his cranium. And I turned to his wife and I said, I couldn't help but notice these blood vessels. You know, have you noticed them? And she said that she had over the past few months, and she'd been asking his doctors what what's going on here. And she said, not only could they not answer the question, but they didn't seem interested in the in, in the question or the answer. They were dismissive of her question. So she stopped asking. Well, we were not dismissive of that question. And we wanted to get to the bottom of it. And here's a video associated with it. You can see the dilated veins here. Look at this external jugular vein. It's filled like a hose. Look at that internal jugular. You see how it's diving into the neck. Classic venous pulse. Look near the... Uh, near the moles here, you can see that inward movement. See these two moles right here? Let's go back. Look at these two moles right here. Look at that, you can see the temple is moving in. You see that movement? Classic venous pulse. And Leah, you sh that is absolutely what these oncologists, they should have been interested in this. You know, the, uh, you can get something called superior vena cava syndrome where uh, you know the superior vena cava is obstructed by a clot or a tumor or something, and it, it doesn't allow the head to drain properly. And so you get these dilated veins and this elevated jugular venous pressure. That's not what he had in this case, but it is also related to, to their, what they're treating, to his, di to his cancer. They're treating him with chemotherapy and he developed, this ended up just being heart failure from his chemotherapy, a side effect of the uh, treatment of, for his cancer. And, um, you know, it's just amazing to me that it's very easy for people to order, everybody knows how to order a cardiac MRI, but it seems like nobody knows how to read neck veins anymore. And this was an obvious case of, of markedly elevated central venous pressure. And this gentleman was walking around unnecessarily with very bad heart failure for months. Uh, when these physical findings were right there and, and I could have made the diagnosis. Sarah, what is VOD? Vena occlusive disorder. Okay. Yeah. So that, I, I suppose that would be kind of what superior vena cava syndrome could, could be known, also known as. I'm not familiar with that term, but um, yeah, it ended up being anthracycline toxicity from his chemotherapy. Exactly. But you could also think, could it be, could it be tamponade like we saw earlier? Could it be a pericardial effusion giving rise to elevated JVP and patients with cancer get metastases to the pericardium? So, you know, they should have definitely be in, been interested in these physical findings. This is one of my all-time favorite cases. This gentleman um, comes to the hospital with, um, oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, thank you for that uh, explanation. So liver disease after chemo. And it, does it relate to the heart and kind of back up from the heart or is it independent of the heart? Uh, while you're typing in the chat, I will uh, tell you about this case. So this guy, previously healthy, comes into the hospital with, with cardiogenic shock and he spends a week in the ICU. You can see the marks on his neck from where they had lined swan gans catheters and things in his neck. He's getting inotropic therapy, he's getting diuresis, and they make him better. So they transfer him out to the regular floor, the non ICU or intensive care unit. And I'm taking care of him now. So I'm meeting him today for the first time after this. And I have a habit where I don't spend too much time in the chart before I go see a patient. I kind of want to, you know, sometimes just see them and see what I see unbiased. And here I visit with him. And what do I notice here? Well, he's got lots of movement in his neck. And he's got the, in multiple areas, you can see this really bounding pulse is this venous or arterial based on our previous discussion? This is arterial. It's a single outward pulsation. What you catches your eye is outward. It's not inward. In fact, he has a, what's nice about this video is you can actually see his venous pulse here. Do you see this pulse over here? You see how it's diving in? See that movement? Boom, in, 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 in. That's venous over here. This is not venous. This is arterial. And um, so I think to myself, well, he must have aortic insufficiency, as I usually do when I see this type of, of pulsation in the neck. And of course, I go to the, to the fingernails again, and sure enough, I'm seeing 
Quinky's pulse there. This is a way you can bring it out with a flashlight on the other side of the finger. So now I'm thinking, oh, for sure, he has aortic insufficiency, but he does not have uh, that diastolic murmur. And when I go to the echo, he does have mild aortic insufficiency, but it wouldn't be enough to generate these physical findings. So then what do I think? Well, because of that other case I showed you, I thought, okay, he must have high output heart failure then. So I called the cardiologist. And I said, I think he might have, you know, because we're not still not sure why he presented with cardiogenic shock. Does he have high output heart failure? I think he might have that. And they said, well, you know what? He's going to get a cardiac MRI tomorrow. So um, it will tell us whether he has high output physiology or not. So we can just wait on that. And I stopped thinking about it. And the next day he gets that cardiac MRI and he does not have high output heart failure, but the cardiac MRI made the diagnosis that I should have made. I had all the information that I needed to make that diagnosis, but I didn't make it. Uh, but now this condition is on my differential for when I see Corrigan's pulse and uh, Quinky's pulse. Um, does anybody know what, have a guess as to what condition? Yeah, that is really impressive, Sammy. Uh, this is a case of coarctation of the aorta. And as you might imagine, you've got that narrowing in the aorta. And, uh, you know, so most of the cardiac output is going to be going proximal to that narrowing. And then beyond that narrowing, you're going to get a little bit of the cardiac output. So all the pulses proximal are going to be bounding. And I've never seen coarctation listed in the differential for Quinky's pulse or for Corrigan's pulse. Uh, and, and, you know, it should be listed there. It should be listed there. And uh, so what did I do next? Well, once I got that information, I went to the bedside and I felt his uh, femoral pulse and I felt his radial pulse. And there was a delay there. There was a radio femoral pulse delay. And how could I sort of illustrate that in a video? Well, I got these Dopplers. So you're going to hear the sound is the pulse. So let's take a listen. This is a control. Both of his, arch, his radio pulses should come at the exact same time. Hopefully you can appreciate that delay. And uh, thank you for that additional information about VOD, Sarah. Um, that, is, that is very helpful. So this patient has a radiofemoral pulse delay, and uh, the diagnosis is Sammy already uh, got his coarctation in the aorta. Very impressive. Uh, so this condition is now on my differential. So again, in medicine, we're never perfect. You know, um, I don't give this talk to try to imply that I'm the you know world's leading expert on physical exam. I'm learning all the time. And that's the beauty of medicine is that we're constantly learning. And in several of these cases, I didn't know what oil drop sign was. I didn't, I wasn't able to get this diagnosis of coarctation, but next time I see this constellation, I will get this diagnosis. And by the way, he's 44 years old. This is a congenital problem. He went all of his life, including a lot of his adult life with all of his clinicians, including this one right here in front of you, failed him and did not make the diagnosis. And uh, this should have been made. And yeah, his blood pressure uh, was different in all four extremities. And um, that's another clue to the diagnosis of coarctation. By the way, he had 14 chest x-rays during his stay in the ICU, and all of them showed the classic rib notching um, that you see in coarctation of the aorta, but the radiologist did not, did not pick up on it. Two more cases. This is a woman coming in with dyspnea, and um, here are her hands. And what do you notice about her hands here? Yeah, so she's got these little red dots on her hands as well. And when you close in on them and you press down and release, sure enough, they blanch and fill. So these are telang ectasias, just like we saw earlier. And when you ask her to make the universe, now you have a hypothesis. So you ask her to make the universal sign of prayer, um, and bring her hands together. She can't do it. There's a gap between her hands. Her hands cannot fully straighten. They're stuck in this position. She cannot straighten them. This is known as the prayer sign. And when you look in her elbow, she's got this subcutaneous nodule, this hard nodule underneath her um, elbow. 
And um, anybody have an, oh yeah. So uh, Eva has already uh, provided the diagnosis in the chat. You might think about Crest syndrome, you know, calcification, Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, eosinophilic dysphagia. Uh, what's the S is scleroderma. Um, excuse me, sclerodactyly. So that's the prayer sign or hands are stiff. And the, and the uh, T is telangiectasia. Now, why would she be dyspneic, a, a patient with Crest syndrome or systemic sclerosis? Well, you look at her neck veins. Take a slow breath in like you did before. She's about to breathe in and look at those, look at that movement climb all the way up, up. to her neck. She has Kussball sign like the other gentleman did. In. And when you listen to her heart, You hear a very loud P2. So notice how this is S2, and notice that there are two components to S2. The first one is is aortic. The second one is pulmonic. She absolutely has pulmonary hypertension, and that's why she's short of breath. Last case is a young woman coming in with a, a TIA. Basically, she had some slur slurred speech, some weakness. By the time she gets to the emergency room. It goes away. Her exam is documented as normal. She's discharged home. And a couple days later, she develops acute right-sided flank pain. She comes back into the emergency room. They document a subtle murmur with no further description. They get a CT of her, of her abdomen out of concern for appendicitis. The CT does not show appendicitis, but it does show a completely occluded renal artery. Here's her left kidney, and you can see it's lighting up with contrast. Here's her right kidney, no contrast. She go, undergoes an emergency embolectomy procedure. And shortly after that, she develops hemoptysis and hypoxemia. They do a million dollar workup for thrombophilia. They get a CTA for, you know, out of concern for pulmonary embolism. The CTA does not show pulmonary embolism, but it does show bilateral ground glass opacities. She undergoes a bronchoscopy procedure. Finally, they decided to do, end up doing an echocardiogram and it reveals the diagnosis that they could have made, probably the, should have made the first day she presented. And this is what her heart sounded like. If they had just listened to the right spot and sort of knew what to listen for. There's a lot going on in this sound. So I'm gonna give you the annotated version. There is uh, S1 is the loudest sound you hear. Systole is relatively quiet. Then there's S2, an extra sound, and then a, a rumbling diastolic murmur that gets louder right before S1. This patient grew up in Mexico. Anybody know what, what lesion this is? Yep, this is mitral stenosis, exactly. And oftentimes patients with mitral stenosis, this is known as valvular AFib. They're at very high risk of cardioembolic events, and that's why she presented with a TIA. They often present with uh, strokes and TIAs, and she had the renal artery embolism as well. Um, so that's the presentation. Thank you so much. You guys were amazing. You were very uh, participatory in getting the right answers even before I ask a question. So thank you so much for your excellent participation and um, for having me. This is a lot of fun for me. So I, I really appreciate you having me. Well, we're really grateful. I think uh, we're all um, really amazed by what we learned and your approach, um, I think, to clinical examination is really inspiring. So thank you so much for taking the time also out of your day to, to spend it here with us and teach us. Um, and yeah, it was, as Paul says in the chat, really impressive what we can learn from these clues. And I just want to share one of my favorite pearls that I think I'll take away is that the clinical exam is evolving and that we're always, it might change from day to day and that it's not just done one time, but it's important to actually meet the patient and examine them. Um, and I see that there is a question in the chat. Is it still okay for you? We do... Hey. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I have time. No, no problem at all. Yes. That's a great question, Sarah. So 
I explained the cardioembolic phenomena, but why, what about the hemoptysis? So patients with mitral stenosis are at increased risk for, they often present with hemoptysis. It's one of the um, uh, sort of cardiac lesions that can present this way. They are very uh, sensitive to hemodynamic changes. And I don't know exactly, I think I used to know the mechanism, but I might not be able to explain it to you off the top very well, but it has to do with the pulmonary pressures the the pulmonary uh, the, the the capillaries of the of the uh, in, in the lungs are under now increased pressure because of the of mitral stenosis lesion, and they're not used to 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 being under pressure. And with any sudden change in hemodynamics, if you're if for example your blood pressure goes up, so she remember she went for this embolectomy procedure, so her body was stressed. And that probably triggered a hemodynamic change where her blood pressure went up and patients with mitral stenosis are exquisitely sensitive to hemodynamic changes. And it probably shot those pressures up and it caused those pulmonary capillaries, a sudden increase in pressure caused them to burst because again, they're not used to increased pressure. So patients with mitral stenosis can often present with hemoptysis, especially in times of under stress or you know, uh, when their hemodynamics change in such a way to where those capillaries burst. That you double check that explanation and, and uh, you should look that up. But that's what I recall from when I looked this up years ago as to why, why do patients with mitral stenosis specifically develop hemoptysis? Why don't all patients with heart trouble develop? Why not patients with aortic stenosis develop hemoptysis? It doesn't happen. Because for some reason, mitral stenosis patients are very sensitive to hemodynamic changes that aortic stenosis patients are not. Yeah, any other, any other uh, questions? Happy to hang out with you guys. You're a great group and you're asking excellent questions. So I, I always appreciate that. Except for Nicola, he never asks good questions. They're, it's always a waste of time. <laughs> um I would I would have one more question Dr. Mansoor thank you so much that was just so incredible um I already know you and what you do and it was still um I learned so much and I, I think you inspired also a lot of us to take a closer look at the patient and really take your time and that really would make out a good doctor to do the right tests and don't spend too much money on expensive tests and I wanted to ask we have a lot of um, young new doctors here I'm like a doctor in training since three months and I always find it so so hard to assess the JV, JVP so could you maybe like walk us through step by step which side do you go um do you first start supine or upward just a quick maybe a just a quick reminder how you do it I think many doctors and find it very hard to do that absolutely yeah so let me pull up um let me pull up a another presentation here that will be helpful, I think, for you guys. Um, where is it? Please take your time. There it is. Go back now to zoom share okay can you guys see this okay so by the way this is a normal regular venous pulse and remember see how we're at the side here and we're looking and you can see that what catches your eye about this movement in or out in you see how so this is classic venous pulse and look how diffuse it is it takes up a very large area of the neck but it's that inward movement that will catch your eye so let's um for me there's and you know obviously this is a whole other talk but i'm going to try to do this uh, sort of in a concise way but for me there's three kind of components to the jugular venous pulse but the first component is identify identification we want to know where is what is the pulse and this is the question that sammy's asking so Let's go to the, um, and we talked about this already. You really want to position the patient in an optimal way. You want to make sure their neck and their torso are in the same plane. They're at the same angle. Their neck is nice and relaxed. And, and observing from a tangential perspective is key. 
And now we want to look for movement in the neck. And the, the classic window for movement is between the clavicle and the jaw. If the pulse is below the clavicle, you're not going to see it. If, if it's above the jaw, you might see it like we did in that patient whose temple was moving, but it's really not ideal for a, for a sort of evaluation. So you want to manipulate the patient's angle and tell that you see the movement between the angle of the jaw and the, and the clavicle. And then you want to ask, is it venous, the movement that I'm seeing, is it venous or arterial? And here are all the strategies that we talked about. So an arterial pulse is a single peak that's quick and sharp. The venous pulse is double and it's undulating, meaning it has like a, a slow, gradual rolling rise and fall. The most striking feature of the arterial pulse is that outward movement, as I've stressed. And the venous pulse is the opposite. It's the troughs that catch your eye. And there's an asterisk on that one because, again, that is, to me is the single best way to tell the difference. The breadth of movement is helpful. As I mentioned, arterial pulses are pinpoint. Venous pulses are diffuse. The venous pulse will move with patient position respiratory cycle or pressure on the abdomen, it will rise up if you put pressure on the abdomen. An arterial pulse doesn't change with any of those because remember, it's just anatomical where you're seeing it. And then lastly, the arterial pulse is palpable, whereas the venous pulse is generally non-palpable. So let's look at this video here of this patient who's in the right position. We're looking from a tangential. And where, where do you notice movement? Remember, set three is looking for movement and identifying movement. So where is that movement? Yeah, it's more pinpoint. It's not that diffuse. It's right, not, right up here. Exactly. Yeah. And when we're seeing this movement here, it's pinpoint. It's not diffuse. It's outward. We're just seeing a quick, quick shock like outward movement. And obviously it goes back in, but it's very gradual and it's hard to notice. So this is a classic arterial pulse. Okay. And then, and here it is annotated. So you can kind of see it. Boom. There it is. Boom. Right there, you can really see it. Boom, boom. Now, compare that with this movement, okay? So this movement is very different. Now we're seeing diffuse, you can see it all along here. What catches our eye about this is the inward, down, 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 down. It's undulating, it's got a rolling rise and fall. The active parts here are the X and Y troughs. Boom, 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 boom. The A and the V wave are just past, they're very passive. You don't really see it coming out. And um, it's got kind of a rolling quality to it. That This is classic Venus. So hopefully that kind of um, answers the question, you know, and, and this presentation is available elsewhere too. You know, so if you want to watch this lecture, it's like a 50 minute lecture. Um, it will really go through the jugular venous pulse exam and kind of, you know, teach at least my method for how I approach it. And hopefully at the end of the lecture, you'll, you'll be much better at appreciating it. Here's a good example of a venous pulse here and an arterial pulse here. Single outward pulse, venous is you now undulating, it's inward. And uh, hopefully that, that answers the question. Just, just amazing. Maybe, maybe if I can just maybe ask a, a question. Um, it's always great to talk to you, Andre. I, I've uh, organized a talk actually with, with Dr. Mansour about a year ago, and I've been part. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, by the way, I'm, my name is Nicola, Croatian medical student, and and I was I'm actually a new member of this local of this uh, community. Um, and and uh, I've learned so much from you guys, from Sammy, Lea, Yuri, and, and for me, there was no better way to give back to this community than to share with you guys, uh, Andrew Mansur, who's, who's just a great, great lecturer. So it's it's always a pleasure. So maybe just a quick question for, for, for Andrew. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was, sorry? Yes, go ahead, Nicola. <laughs> yes, I was just uh, also answering a question. Um, uh, Eva had asked, to share the link to the lecture. And even, even if you go to pdxpdx.com, um, physical diagnosis pdx.com or pdxpdx, you will find a bunch of this you know, material on there. And there's a there's if you go into the activities tab, there's a lecture section and you can watch it there. It's also on YouTube. You can find my channel on there, but yeah, you should be able to find it. Uh, Nicola, sorry, you were about to ask a question. And, and by the way, I made a joke earlier that Nicola doesn't have, he asks the best <laughs> questions and is often 
interacting with me on this website and, and asking great questions that um, I think everybody else wants to ask um, and it helps everybody else when he asks these, these questions. So um, please ask. Sure. I, I just wanted to ask like a general question about maybe what are some, some physical maneuvers or signs that you should think everybody should know or that are essential that can maybe really nail down a diagnosis or can really impact the differential diagnosis. I think you mentioned a few times that in a patient who presents with dyspnea, I always take a good look at the JVP. Is there maybe something else that, that really helps you? Great question. And I, I would say that um, with medicine, it's always a constellation of, of findings, you know, um, including parts of the history, the exam, et cetera, and so forth. I, I almost never, you know, there are some things that are pathognomonic. You know, we talked earlier about the algin bleak diagnosis. If I see Lanchese sign, tricuspid regurge, I know right away. There are few things like that. Most things require a constellation of findings. Um, and you never want to hang your hat on one finding. Um, you know, because all of these physical exam findings have likelihood ratios and, you know, they're going to move your pretest probability in one direction or another, but almost never is it one finding that's going to take you to 100%. You know, it's going to move you in a different direction. So you, you know, really want to, um, again, um, there are, uh, just to, to more directly answer Nicola's question, the example he uses is a great one. In a patient with dyspnea, I mean, the, the jugular venous pulse is critical. I could not practice medicine without knowing this exam. Um, you know, it tells, it could tell me to focus, you know, and somebody presenting with dyspnea, it's usually the heart or the lungs that are involved. Of course, it can be things like metabolic acidosis or anemia, but most often it's either the heart or the lungs. And the jugular venous pulse is going to tell me, it's going to tell me which direction I need to go. And it's really critical in that scenario. Now, if I, if the jugular venous pulse is normal in that situation, well, now all of a sudden the lung exam becomes critical. So I'm going to focus on the lung exam. And if I hear, you know, if I hear diffuse, uh, you know, fine Velcro crackles in their lung, now I know, okay, I'm probably dealing with pulmonary fibrosis. And then the hands become important. Then I look for clubbing. You know, this is something that you might miss if you don't specifically look for it. You know, 10 clinicians could evaluate a patient with clubbing, and I bet nine of them miss the clubbing because they don't look for it. So, it, again, it, it's one of those things where, where different exams become important depending on your hypothesis. And as the case is unfolding, I don't look for clubbing in everybody, but I do if my previous exam or my history leads me down that path. So I think a lot of exams are critical, um, and it it just depends on the on the on the situation, the scenario. But the JVP is is I would say critical in all patients. Basic things things like the cardiac exam, the lung exam, you know, the abdominal exam, the neuro exam. These things are all really critical and will help you at different times depending on the patient. Um, and again, you want to practice in a hypothesis driven way. So okay, I hear I'm hearing Velcro crackles. This person might have might have. ILD or interstitial lung disease. So I'm going to look for the for the clubbing. I'm going to order that high resolution CAT scan. I'm not we're not against technology. We just want it to be used and ordered in the right way. As Sammy was mentioning earlier, you don't want to order unnecessary CAT scans on patients. That comes at a very high cost, both literally because co testing costs money, but also figuratively because sometimes testing begets more testing and begets invasive procedures. When you order that CAT scan and it shows that lesion in the liver that's totally benign and doing no harm to the patient, now all of a sudden we biopsy it and then we nick an artery and now they're bleeding to death in the ICU, all because of an unnecessary test that was ordered. So anyway, you hear those Velcro crackles, now's the time to order that CAT, CAT scan because now you're looking for honeycombing and reticulation and the signs of interstitial lung disease on a test, a specific test that was ordered for that reason. So uh, Nicola, there are some exams that I do on everybody, like the heart, the lung, but most often it's it's hypothesis driven and things become very important depending on the rest of the preceding history that and exam that came before it. So what a, what a what a great answer as always. And I maybe just wanted to give a shout out to, to Andre. He's not just an amazing clinician, an amazing lecturer, he's also a writer. This is his book. I don't leave my room without this book. I take it everywhere. It's a really great book. If you guys are into uh, the differential diagnosis and schemas, I really recommend it. And also, please check out his website, the PDX. 
uh, but make sure to bring really good headphones. There's a lot of real you know, uh, recordings of, of hard sound, lung sounds, and I don't think there's any other website like that. And also follow follow Andre Mansur on Twitter and help me drive him to madness with, with questions. And, and that's, that, that's everything for me today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again to Andre. And we would love to have you again, of course. It would be my pleasure. I really appreciate, um, you know, anytime I can hang with Nicola and the people he's hanging with, I know they're good people. I know you all are good people and you guys are amazing uh, today. You're answering questions. You're asking great questions, uh, you know, um, and it was just a great, it was a great lecture. It was a great time. So I'm always happy to come back. Yeah, just thank you again. And um, I learned so much through this session. I love just also spending this time uh, with all of you today. And as I see, there are no more questions for now in the chat. And um, because we've been, we've been hanging out, although time flew by, I still want to respect your time. So thank you so much for being here today. And yeah, hopefully not the last time to interact with you. And I wish you a nice rest of your day. My pleasure. Thank you, Leah. I really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. Thank Bye. Bye. Bye.